Hi, I'm Eddie Burke. I've been the bartender at the Hollywood Improv for 40 years, and this is my podcast, Eddie's Bar at the Improv. All right, hey guys, this is Eddie Burke. Welcome to another episode of Eddie's Bar at the Improv podcast. I have got an unbelievable guest for you today, Mr. Rich Scheidner. Eddie. Hey, Rich, thank you for being here. Thank you, Eddie. There, let's, let's go first with what brought you to L.A. at this time, right now. Like, you're, you're doing your one-man show, it, The History of Comedy. You're on tour with history that. History Stand-Up Comedy. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And you, you, you've been just doing a little tour with the whole thing, and how's it been going? Great. The other night, which you know was here at the, mm-hmm. at the Improv Lab, and it was the people there. There were, there were people from my high school there who weren't <laughs> great, comedians. Yeah. There, of course, there were some great comedians there and, and people who know about the history of stand-up comedy. It was, it was a thrill. It was a fun show. When you say the history of stand-up comedy, you're talking about the real history of oh, yeah. how it started, not just... You know, the days of, like, the 80s and the 90s. Right, right, right. You're right. talking about the 80s and 90s of 1800. Yeah, I'm talking about 1861 when it started. Right. And, uh, so we're covering 158 years of stand-up comedy. What a, what a unique perspective. I mean, Ed, the whole idea is just unreal. Yeah. Where are you going with that after here? Well, I've got more dates to do. I just, uh, I'm doing some comedy festivals. I just got an offer, just accepted a Moon Tower Festival in Austin. So wherever I can do it, I'm doing it. I I just need to get it up and do it as much as possible. It's just as much Mm. as any other comic and any other time you have a new act, you have to get it up on its feet. When are you doing it in Austin? That's in April, end of April. I don't I can't remember okay, exactly. So we'll, we'll definitely get his episode up. Yeah, yeah, April. yeah, yeah. I said so I got a bunch guys... of dates. I have a bunch of dates to do it and I'm just gonna keep doing more and more. I'm just mm-hmm. I just love doing it. It's just well, fun. Look, guys, look up the history of stand up comedy, because this is one of the more unique shows you will ever see. Because when people talk about the history of comedy, we're all talking about the eighties, the Yeah, 70s. most people they don't go back any further than Lenny Bruce. Though. Right. That's the era, you know, more so Lenny Bruce and but, and then, uh, that's where people think it's sure, started. sure, sure. But, but it's it really not. It's really an, it's an original American art form. What? Uh, so, okay, now let's get into your history. Okay, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> what? Uh, when did you start doing stand up? 1977 in Washington D.C. Why? Uh, I was going to law school. Well, I guess that's a joke <laughs> in itself. Okay. I was always funny. I was just always funny, but I never thought about doing this. I, I mean, I did. I tried. I, you know, approached this the stage in odd ways different times but I never had no idea about doing it and a friend of mine in law school Howard Vine he just comes up one day I found a place where you're going to do I don't know if we called it stand-up comedy where you're going to do comedy and took me down to some coffee house Iguana Coffee House the basement of a church in Washington D.C. it's just talent night singers poets Mm -hmm. dancers whatever people were playing chess it was just a really informal thing and uh, I did it for the first time. And then I started doing it around town. There were no comedy clubs. Right. And, and then I, I just started getting jobs opening up for bands. And uh, that, that was... How how, that I'd actually about? learned to do stand-up comedy a lot, opening up for rock bands. That's my crazy. early days. I mean, most of my stage time was that. That's like... It that's... was... first job I had was opening for Ramones. Are you serious? Seriously. <laughs> that... The Child Harold, 1978. You talk about hard knocks and, and uh, oh, yeah, I got right into the fire. Oh, yeah, yeah. Did you also, were you doing anything like uh, when you were in college? Um, no, I was not a performer. Never, I was, I, I was a, a pseudo-athlete, mm-hmm. but I was not a, a, performer. Not a performer. I never never performed any plays. And I, no, I was stage fright, horrible stage fright. But did you not fright. do sketches? No, nothing. No, I, I, in college... Um, a, a professor, I was funny in this public speaking class. I did some funny things. Yeah, first <laughs> right. thing I ever did, I remember getting like a big laugh was, hey, everybody had to do speeches. So people were doing, you know, the Gettysburg Address, because we were at Gettysburg College. People are doing different uh, uh, speeches throughout history. And I, I, I don't know why I did this, but I, I took uh, David Bowie's song, Changes. I wrote, you know, this, uh, there weren't any lyric places to go, like on Google or whatever. I had to play the record a million times, get the lyrics, wrote all the lyrics down, and read them seriously, and got laughs. Oh, I'll just bet, deadpan yeah. reading those lyrics got laughs in the class and the professor was like you're funny can you do that again and then I wrote what I know now to be a song parody I took Sympathy for the Devil and wrote Sympathy for the Insurance Salesman <laughs> I wrote a song parody without knowing it got more laughs and he said you should uh, uh, write he was involved with the school uh, plays or the theater mm-hmm. department and, all, and they, they do this uh, yearly thing about, about the school making you know like a uh, 
a review where they did sketches, make, and I wrote funny sketches for the school. Oh, okay. I didn't yeah. even know what I was doing. I just wrote things I thought were funny. You I know, thought. when you don't know what you're doing, it's usually the <laughs> best results. Yeah. I'm, I'm interested in, in uh, your opening for bands. That has got to be a, a oh. hard road. Oh. I mean, they're there they, for the band. Oh, yeah. And a lot of times they had no idea there was an opening act. And they certainly didn't expect to see a comedian. This was not when everybody was aware of stand-up comics. And mm -hmm. a lot of times I was introduced uh, 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 just Rich Scheidner, please welcome Rich Scheidner, not comedian Rich Scheidner. And I'd be walking out, and you could, I could see people looking at me like, where's your guitar, man? What are you, just what, what are you gonna do? And, and so, and then there were a lot of brutal, I just developed a thick skin. They, were, they heckled me, I went back hard. I, was, I grew up in New Jersey, and, and where people just, you know, right. would just yeah, say you, busted yeah. balls. Mm -hmm. So they, were, they would bust my balls, I'd bust them back. Right. So I was good with hecklers. And um, people love that. They, yeah, they yeah. like you coming back yeah. at them and stuff. Yeah. Were there any experiences with that? <clears throat> Excuse me. Where like you said to yourself, I think I want to go into the audience and kill that guy. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Never. It happened after I've been doing stand-up comedy for a while. I actually had a, a fist fight on stage. Oh, really? Once in 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 Michigan. Do tell. In Lansing, Michigan. Yeah, it was. Uh, uh, I think it was like 1981. Joe Dunkel had this uh, club, Wits End. And it was a former biker bar that he leased, and I found out he found out later that the the bikers uh, wanted to get the bar back, so they wanted to ruin his comedy. Oh. So I was on stage, and they were supposed to shut down the pool tables in the back and the video games. Right? Mm -hmm. I think it was like Pong and, and yeah. Space Invaders or whatever. Right? Yeah, nothing noisy. Not, right? Yeah, noisy <laughs> crap. And they shut them down, but these one guys wouldn't stop playing pool. And I'm on stage, and they're just you know cracking those balls and just you know disrupting the jokes. Sure. And so I was like trying to be nice. Hey guys, you know if you shut it down, I'll I'll play you pool afterwards for beers, you know, well, nah, F you, F you, and finally, uh, I, I finally hit up, one guy was wearing, I, I, I'll never forget this, he was wearing an REO Speedwagon t-shirt, and I was, and I went after him, I said, REO Speedwagon, that's a limp dick bam, and you got a limp dick t-shirt, oh. you know, and I was like, run after him, he, he, he throws down the cue stick and rushes the stage, which is dumb. If you're in a bar fight, bring the cue stick. You know, you've got something there. <laughs> That's stupid right off the bat. Exactly. And I'm right. standing on stage watching him come running up there. And then, this way, I don't forget, he's, tr he's scrambling to get up on the stage. He's having a heart. It was a high stage. And he reaches his hand out like I'm going to help him up. Right? <laughs> yeah. So I do. I just, I'm an old wrestler, so I just yanked him like a drag. Like a drag. I dragged him by me, and I started goofing. I'd like, I got behind him. And I'm, it was this day when you could do any kind of deliverance reference. Right. Yeah, so I was like banging matter, yeah. from behind, going like, squeal like a pig. And the place is going crazy. <laughs> audience is going crazy. Then he gets up, and I forget. We're in a fight. I kind of forget it. Yeah. And he gets up. He tags me a couple times, and I we start fighting. And I got the best of him, but... But it was a good fight. It was a good right, fight. And then finally, finally, somebody comes up and they take him off stage. And this, this, this is the best part to me, to me, looking back. And then I turn around and start doing my act again, as if I'm going to, you know, <laughs> right, as if the audience is going to yeah. go with me. Right. And the audience is like, no, 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 no. You're not a comedian anymore. You're done. Yeah. You're a maniac. It was entertaining, <laughs> but no comedy. And I never told that story to anybody until I'm working with Robert Klein at the punchline in Atlanta, like in the 80s, right? mm -hmm. um, uh, they hired me to open up for Klein for a, a few days, which I loved because I idolized Klein. And we're hanging out backstage and talking, telling stories. And I I never told a story to anybody. And I tell him, and he howls. He goes, I got in a fist fight in the stage at a bowling alley <laughs> in the Bronx when I first started. And I did the same thing. I got a ripped shirt, and I turned around trying to do my act again. I can imagine so many comics must must have a, a story like that where you know they say something and some idiot in the office is in the office in the audience decides well, fuck this, I'm going, I'm I'm going at this guy. Yeah, yeah, you and I, I I never wanted to go at them. Right. I never had any fear. No, I, I never had any fear on stage mm -hmm. about any of that. I mean, a guy came at me with a knife once. Came through the audience with a knife, and I I didn't see him till the last minute that he had a knife. He was heckling. He was in Texas, Austin, Texas. And, um, and Arthur Chikese, the manager, a couple guys took him down from behind. But I was standing up there going, come on. I, I had my hand probably on the mic stand. I was probably right. like, okay, you got the knife, I got a mic stand. We'll see how this goes. Wow. But, but I wasn't, I wasn't, I don't know why. I never had fear on stage about anybody physically attacking me. I can't imagine that you would. I mean, you're up there performing and entertaining. You're not up there like, you know, let's see who's going to come and get me tonight. No, you know, that's, no. That's not the way it goes. No. Where did you, where you, you, uh... How did you segue into other places, getting out of the rock band? Uh, well, I, I, genre? I still worked in opening up rock bands, even after I moved to New York City in 79. 
I still would go back to Washington D.C. It was a big part of my income was opening up for bands down there, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, so eventually I didn't have to open up for bands anymore because the comedy clubs started becoming so plentiful, and I was mm -hmm. booked so many times in comedy clubs I didn't open for bands anymore until like later I came to open for bands in Las Vegas and Tahoe, but that was a whole other yeah, thing, right? That, but that in terms of rock bands, they kind of stopped around 81, 82, something like that. How did you segue into L.A.? I mean, when did you say to my, yourself? My like first wife, time? Carol Liefer, uh -huh. um, she got a, a pilot called Toast of Manhattan, Barry Levinson. Sure, I actually. TV pilot, mm -hmm. right? And I think Paul Reiser was on it, Gilbert Gottfried, and she was hired. And back then, it's the hard she to writing read. or acting? no? She was performing. She uh -huh. was performing. She got hired, but back then, that was always the graduation. You had to get out of New York to go to L.A. Right. No, there was nothing happening in, in L.A. This was even before David Letterman had his late night show on. Mm -hmm. There was nothing happening. So everybody eventually was like, "When do you move to L.A.?" That was a big question. Uncle Dirty, a comedian, used to say, sure. "You don't move to L.A. until they say Saul will pick you up at the airport." <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know, we moved. Uh, she was like, I want to move. I'm ready to move. And I, to me, it was like, well, I can drink and do drugs in L.A. just as easily as New York. No problem. Yeah. So we nice moved. And easy. We moved. Well, speaking of that, you had uh, some issues with that for quite a while. You know, Eddie, you're a big part of this story. Big uh, part of the story. I can, I can see me right now sitting down at the end of that bar. I used to sit down at the end of that bar every night, and I was drinking. Well, you better I, explain that. Yeah. No, well, you were bartending, and I was uh, obviously drinking a lot and, and doing coke. And, and I'd sit down into the, the bar there, and if there, somebody put a song on the jukebox I didn't like, I'd shake it till the, till the till song it. moved, and Eddie'd be like, stop that. And then I was also drinking and saying, I got to quit drinking. I think Eddie got sick of hearing that. So you sent a friend of mine, Mark. Um, over who, who himself had, had quit drinking recently <laughs> and you said can you get rid of him too could you I, there's two problem drinkers I can get rid of here in the next month and uh, so Mark took me to a place where I could uh, quit drinking help me quit drinking and, uh, and, right. and uh, that's like uh, uh, 34 over 34 years ago wow right and you, really so you, I credit you hugely with that Eddie thank you <laughs> thank always thank you I appreciate it it's called tough love <laughs> <laughs> you know <laughs> It's, uh, yeah, look, you had less problems and probably more tips for me. I probably tip hey, more yeah, for Diet yeah. Cokes than I did for my Jack Daniels. That, that, yeah, because you didn't even remember what you were drinking. No, was no, like, no. Did I pay for this? No, no. 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 Those, those were crazy <laughs> All times. Right. I mean, the, the I people know. drinking back then, it was, you know, it, it was, there wasn't the stigma of, of drinking back then. And, and now, or driving, or yeah. driving. Oh, yeah. Oh, I mean, I drove around West Hollywood drunk and high all the time. <laughs> yeah, everybody did. All over Southern California. People would leave and then kind of like, you know, sadly, you know, the mothers uh, against drug driving came into existence because of obvious reasons. Dude, obviously, and, it was a good they, thing. It was a yes. good thing they, they came off. And right? then it, it kind of like started to go like, all right, guys, got to drink responsibly and all that. Yeah, and, it's good. Uh, it's good. Yeah, we actually had cops that would sit out by on, uh, what is it, La Cienega, um, Fairfax, and wait for people to come out of the club because they, they knew they, Easy they were drinking. Definitely. <laughs> when did you when did you start uh, performing here? Eighty two. I came out. So I was in the Improv in New York. I was a regular there and catch a ride and start a comic strip. But I was my main club was the Improv there. I came out to do even at the Improv. Bud brought me out. Actually, he hadn't seen me. He had come back to look for new, more comics to come out to do even at the Improv when his first mm -hmm. first uh, right. couple tapings. Right. So he came there to look for comics, and I wasn't there. But his wife. Or his ex-wife now, Silver, recommends she says, you, you really have to bring this guy to do it, too. So Carol and I came out, stayed at the Tropicana. Tropicana. Yeah. Right? And we partied so hard, that I'll never forget this, that I, like a leather-jacketed punk guy came, knocked on the door like 5 in the morning and said, man, can you tone it down? <laughs> I said, we, we, and, and, and the, you remember that, um, um, uh, Shaquem, think of the name of the, uh, the restaurant there, they had a famous Dukes. restaurant. Dukes. Mm -hmm. Dukes. Dukes at the Trap. Yeah. So one morning, I'm all hung or whatever. My morning, I say morning, noon, one o'clock. <laughs> whatever it was, yeah. I go into Dukes. Just to, getting to, dark. Yeah, just getting turned just, dark. Just, yeah. just, just to start my day with breakfast. And I walk in, and I see Tom Waits sitting there. Oh. And I just blurt it out. I go, Tom Waits. <laughs> it's like 19, 1981. <laughs> Tom yeah. Waits. Right? I just blurt it out. And then I feel kind of embarrassed. But I never forget this. I sat down to have my breakfast, and Tom Waits brings his plate over and sits down and can I join you? Oh, wow. And he starts, what do you, what do you thought, what band you in? He thought I was in a rock band, right? Because I have the leather jacket. And I go, I, go uh, I tell him I'm a stand-up comic. He starts asking me about comedy. This is one of those moments. I didn't know, I didn't have answers for his questions. 
His mm. questions were better than my answers. And I, and I think I bored him because after a few minutes, he just left. Right? <laughs> because this guy doesn't know anything. But, you know, isn't it interesting, like, no matter who you meet and in what other fields they're in, being a stand-up comic, people want to know about it. Well, you know, I, look at this. This is Tom Waits. I, and back then, it was unusual. And I remember when I first started, if you go to a party or someplace and somebody says, what are you doing? I go, stand-up comedy. They go, whoa. Never met one of you before, but now if you say it, I, I used to, I stopped saying I was a stand-up comic at a point because you say it, they go, yeah, my mom was doing stand-up exactly. for a while. My grandmother's yeah. doing it. Mm. Everybody's doing it. It's, it's become, because of social media, it's become something that everybody, everybody does. It's, uh, you turn around and I, I'll talk to somebody at the bar who you just think is uh, the average guy and he goes, yeah, I, I do stand-up and I, well, where do you do stand-up? You know, I did it in my living room, and, and my uh, mother said I was really funny. So, you know, I put it on uh, YouTube and, and all, and I'm like, you get any laughs? Is that, you know, you've been anywhere? No, but, you know. I'm, I'm a comic. I'm, I'm working. I'm a comic. I'm working on Yeah, it. yeah. We're, we're, we're talking about, you have more hobbyists now than, it, yeah. it was not possible to be a hobbyist back in the 70s and 80s. Nobody gave you stage time as a hobby. You had to hang out. You got your stage time, your first stage time here at 1, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the morning. Well, you know, so I, you had a regular job. You weren't hanging out every night, one, two, three o'clock in the morning. Back in those days, it, it's like, I've said this before, there were like maybe 250 comics, you know, th that were well known and, and making a living and just, and plugging it. Now there's 250,000, maybe a million, you know, who I, knows I, how many. I have no idea. You're absolutely right. Yeah. I did a count I, when I was working on this. I've been doing this history research for like 10 years. And I, I figured 1979, the best I came up with, a little over 400 professional working comics in America. Mm -hmm. All the names I could get from, everybody I could get names from, Alan Bursky, whoever. Sure. And today, there's 400 in Toledo. I mean, it's, you know, it's... Oh, yeah. It's, I mean, it's 400 it's totally, in here every night that have never stepped foot on stage. And, and calling yourself a stand-up comic, because uh, you, you remember Bob Schimmel, Robert sure. Schimmel, right? You remember mm -hmm, yeah. Great Schimmel. Mm -hmm. He had such great stories. Oh, and he really tells a story when he first moved out here from Phoenix, right? He has some great stories. He was a salesman for stereo, stereo salesman at Beverly Hills Stereo, Beverly, Beverly Stereo, something like that. It's a high-end thing over here. And uh, he's working there, and he gets a call. They get a call from Steve Martin for a new stereo for his house in Beverly Hills. So, wow. of course, Schimmel says, I grabbed that ticket. I, he grabbed the, you know, they said, you want the best you get? Right, he gets all the Bang & Olsen, whatever it is, the best stuff he could get, rushes over to Steve Martin's house. In the living room, Steve Martin's sitting there, Schimmel's setting up the stereo in front of Steve Martin. He tells me, he says, I can't help myself. I gotta start doing my jokes. <laughs> I knew you were gonna say <laughs> that. I'm going like, oh so God. He's, he's doing his jokes and Steve Martin's not giving him anything. No laughs, nothing, right? So Schimmel says, and finally I snapped, right? I just go, you know, Steve, I'm a comedian too. Oh right. He actually said, right? So Steve Martin goes, no, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> you're a stereo installer. Oh, that's And hilarious. when you make your money doing stand-up comedy, then you can then be a stand-up comedy. Cut to, cut to, like five years after that, Schimmel's first CD is released. First mm -hmm. CD, who does the liner notes? No Steve kidding. Martin. Wow. Yeah, what a wow. Right? Yeah, that's interesting. That's, you talk about that, and I've told this story before. Like, one, uh, when they were shooting evening at the improv one night, Bud is up on stage. I think it was, uh, what was uh, Carson's band wow. leader? Doc Severinsen, Doc Severinsen yeah. yeah. Doc Severinsen was hosting. So in the audience is Johnny Carson. And Bud's up there telling some little joke, and, and uh, nobody's... <laughs> <laughs> responding and and uh, Bud says very innocently well just a little attempt at humor and Johnny yells out very little <laughs> I got like, by Johnny yeah it, it's uh, oh. th that kind of stuff is priceless oh god you know to, to hear things from, from these guys how often did you do did you do a couple of the evening at the improvs oh I got I had to do a dozen of them yeah I had to for between uh I lost so many tapes and over, we were just talking about getting rid of things. I got rid of boxes of tapes and oh. I was so angry at one point. I was get rid of all my comedy. I get rid of too much stuff. But from uh, 81 was the first one we did. And probably, I, I think probably 
92 or 91 wow. the last one I did I mean over that years, years I did one or two a year for sure that's that's like the the entire run was yeah yeah like, oh, I was on there right to till they remember when I did it they said this is I is think that this is the, this is the last batch we're doing and you did that in Santa Monica Santa Monica, so Santa not, Monica that's right because it was here for the first four or five years yeah. and then when they opened Santa Monica right. because it had a much bigger room yeah. whenever what whatever that run was that was a long time I, I know I, I did a, a whole bunch of them uh, did, did you have you had any experiences that where you say to yourself this is a highlight of my career not career but a highlight something I'll always remember or a low light <laughs> that of, of something that uh, happened well besides the, low, the fight. I'll give you two I'll give you two off the top of my head the low light was uh, when I forgot my act doing my HBO One Night Stand. <laughs> oh. That was a hard moment. And and I look back and I go, that's because I tried to be too precise, too tight, like memorize, you know, 20, right. 30 minutes, whatever it was, instead of going, I'm just going to do 30 minutes because I was doing comedy all the time and I could have just gone up there just, here, I'm just, here's 30 minutes of, of tape, you know, here it is, cut this, just do this. Just do the 30 minutes. Instead, I was like, this has to go to this, that, this, that to be precise and every word precise. And uh, I, 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 look, I literally just went, I don't know what I'm doing. I, I, my mind went completely blank. You overprepared. N- overprepared. Yeah. And, um, um, I think the, the director was Sue Wolf, and she just stopped, came out, and said, you okay? I said, and so we started up again, and, and th- that was the first show. So they did two, sh- two, two shows, tapings. two mm-hmm. tapings a night at the, at the Old Vic in Chicago. And then the second show, that was the one, basically, that I just went through. That was fine. But it was so embarrassing me. I mean, it took me a long time to get over that. Really, oh, I was yeah. embarrassed by it. I was totally embarrassed. That's, it's a tough thing for, you know, you're yeah, up there, yeah, yeah. and I assume there was a Never happened to me audience. before. Any time where I was like not aware, I mean, because stamp comedy was my salvation. It was like right. I was always in the moment. And your therapy the, at the same time. Everything. The you, biggest moment, the best moment I ever had wasn't on stage. I was always a huge fan of Albert Brooks. Always. Loved Albert Brooks. Kevin Pollock used to call my house and do Albert Brooks, leave messages for me and Al, and Albert Brooks, uh-huh. like after Tonight Show or Letterman or something. It was, he knew, I mean, I loved Albert Brooks. When I, before I was doing stand up comedy, I'd always look for him on TV. So a few years ago, my son and his daughter are in the same school up at Roscomere, uh, elementary school. And I saw him a couple times at, um, never had any, never met him before, never, never talked to him, but I saw him at a couple parent teacher things, you know, or events mm-hmm. there, little charity events, fairs and stuff. I saw him up there during the year. Never could go say anything to him. I was like, oh, my God, that's Albert Brooks, man. You know, I don't know what I would say. I'd already botched up several celebrity encounters. Right. Waylon Jennings, I was on a plane with him once. I love Waylon Jennings. I spent the whole ride trying to figure out what to say with him. He's in the seat behind me. What am I going to say? What am I going to say? This lands. We're getting our baggage. I turn him so I say, Waylon, I certainly appreciate your music. He says, he looks at me with that blank look like he's heard us a million times. He goes, and just clicks in the cliche response. And I appreciate you appreciate my music. And gets his bag. <laughs> and walks off. So I never did well with a celebrity encounters. So I didn't know what to tell you, say anything to Albert Brooks and ruin it. So one day, his his daughter and my son were friends. So we're waiting for them to stop talking. We're the only people around. He's like Mike over there. He's eight feet away from me, standing there. We're both watching our kids talk. So I just, but I said, the heck with it. I walk over and said, Albert, you don't know me. He says, I know you. You're Rich Shiner. You're funny. Wow. And I was stunned. I was wow. stunned. And my son remembers this. He never saw me cry before. I was sitting in the car crying. Wow. He said, Dad, what's wrong? I said, nothing's wrong, son. Nothing's wrong. It's all good. Oh, that, I couldn't believe it. What a story to have. I mean, you know, when, when your idol says to you that just That's, out of out of nowhere. I had no idea he knew I existed. Who, who else were, did you sort of maybe model yourself after? Or, well, or, I or think admire? everybody in my generation who's a monologist was affected by, obviously, Carlin and mm-hmm. and, and Richard Pryor and and. and, and Robert Klein. Robert Klein was huge to me. Yeah, I, uh, he you know, was the, smart, literate. He was funny, great performer. He put the punch in punchline. Robert Klein. Yeah, <laughs> those <laughs> those names come up all yeah, the time. Yeah, yeah. There's a though, for my generation. I right. mean, watching Richard Pryor's movie at the Uptown Theater in Washington D.C. I was there every day, watching it two times. It, it was, you you also you did a lot. Of, you've done a lot of acting. And no, I'm a terrible actor. Terrible. That I, I, mean, I did. I'm a good did, five line and under guy. But you didn't. I didn't say. <laughs> I wasn't talking about your, the quality of the your little work. roles. I here. said yeah, you, yeah, you've done yeah. a bunch of acting. Yeah, it yeah. doesn't matter. Yeah. It's, uh, 
<laughs> you you were all a regular on uh, Married with Children for the first, first four episodes, first seven or so. Yeah, eight. but um, that was one of those deals. Was as soon as I won the role, I lost the role because really we got down to network. I'd been down a network with Cheers with Woody Harrelson mm -hmm. and lost, and this was almost the next thing. And it was there was no network. There was no network. Fox hadn't even started programming yet. So right. it was like well, this is a new show for a new network. And we get down in the, the network, which there's three actors in the waiting to audition for. That's when the network gets together with the producers, and it's the final decision is going to okay. be made on who gets the role. So these three of us sitting there, the two creators of the show, Michael Moy and Ron Levitt, come walking down the hallway. The actor sitting across me jumps up, runs and hugs Michael Moy. Michael, Michael's like, "You're going to love L.A. My wife's got your room set up for you." Oh, and and, boy. Uh, and I'm like going, "Well, this is over. Yeah. So I'm bothered." <laughs> and the other actor sitting across, he was like, just doubled over, like Lee Harvey Oswald, got shot by Ruby. He was just gut shot. He's doubled over, and 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 I was going to leave. I said, "I'm going to leave," and they just. I, the next thing I know, they're like, Rich, you're first. And I was like, I didn't care. It's the first look. I truly, I didn't care. I walked in, I made fun of everything. Mm -hmm. I made fun of the fact there was no network. I made, and I was loose and fun. I had everybody laughing in the room. And Michael Moy, that was his friend that I beat out. The, the network said, no, we want the funny guy. He's perfect for this role. Ron Levitt told me later, uh, he said, Michael hated you in that role ever as soon as you won it. He says, he, he says, I want to get rid of that guy. Get rid of him. He's terrible. He, oh, no, I'd be on the set. And he'd walk up and he says, come on, come on, man. Add some funny here. Add some funny. Oh, wow. And, uh, and Ed O'Neill would come up and go, ah, he's an asshole. Don't worry about him. You know, he tried to, he, Ed was great. But I thought I was really starting to get good. And then one day, every Friday, we'd get the script for the Monday for the reading. Week, yeah. right? for the, so I'd work it on the weekend for the Monday reading. And it was seven shows in a row, whatever. And one Friday, I don't, I don't get the script. And uh, I Ouch. called my agent. I go, I didn't get my script. He goes, ah, there's a delivery problem. I'll get right back to you. He says, bad news. Calls me. <laughs> <laughs> You're off the show. <laughs> That's how you oh, find out in Hollywood. They don't yeah. send you the script. <laughs> That's got to be devastating. Or was no, it? I don't know. I, just, no. I, I, was, I was rolling so hard then with stand up and doing so well. I didn't think it was a problem. You know, looking back after not getting 11 years of residuals, <laughs> uh, you know, the show was on that right. long. And, and but yeah, that was a, but I didn't at the time, I didn't care. I didn't care. I was like, I'll get something better. Well, the, the way you auditioned too is why you got it is because you didn't care. You figured this isn't that, happening. It's not mine. Yeah. It's not happening. I'll just go in there and, and bust everybody's balls and have, have, get some laughs. That Every actor you talk to will tell you, the, tell me the same story about like, I got this role. I went in, I thought, thought I was just there for the heck of it and so I just did this or did that I was relaxed and that's when you get it all those tricks that the acting teachers and coaches I went to they would tell you when you go in there think of everybody naked and blah blah yeah. blah none of those work for me none of them work yeah that's uh you kind of like take what you can use I and never throw got it out. in stand-up comedy it's the only thing I ever did where I was totally in the moment like my head shut off all the negative thoughts shut off when I was on stage I was in the moment there's no past to regret there's no future to fear I never was in the moment more than I was in stand-up comedy. I never got that in acting. Again, it's your therapy. Uh, it's, yeah, it's it's whatever it was. It was that it that was relief there. that I I just loved it. I just the laugh. That's all. Just there for the laughs. You you have also done a lot of writing. Now, I love uh, writing. I on, love writing uh, on sitcoms and yeah and what yeah, have yeah, you. yeah you you wrote on Roseanne. Yeah, it's uh, I read an interesting story as to how you got that, and I'm going <laughs> to let you tell it because I thought it was hilarious. <laughs> You know, so so when 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 I had my last pilot, Rick Dukeman and I did a pilot. I had like five development deals for a sitcom starring me or co-starring me with Rick Dukeman. The last one was gone. My agent, who who I'd had for a long time, from Tried to William Morris, calls me in the office and says, "There's nothing for you in Hollywood," and he has a box with all my stuff in it. And he said, now here's a bunch of dates we've booked for you. We want no commissions. Our gift to you, parting gift from William oh. Morris. Tour, your final tour on us. Yeah. And so I walk that walk of shame out of the, you know, when you walk out, when you walk in, hey, Rich, all the secretaries, nice to see you. You walk out, they're all busy. They're all yeah. lying down. You got that box of your, your eight by tens and your videotapes oh, in it. Right? So I walk out. The gate, first gig was, it was South Carolina. This is 1991 or 92, wherever it was. South Carolina. A brand new comedy club was in a sports bar across the street from this hockey arena. I remember coming into it. The hockey arena was that night was the Eagles were on their Hell Freezes Over tour, right? There. And so I'm in this sports bar across the street. They think they're going to get a spillover from the hockey. It, anyway, yeah. whatever it was, it was packed. It was great. 
guy starts heckling me during my show. But a good heckling, man. Like, really not, you could tell, you know, you know when it's like somebody's just angry. And, right. But this guy was like trying to see if I was on tonight, if I'm there or if I'm just on remote control, automatic mm-hmm. pilot. And we had fun, both of us getting laughs. And uh, he'd, he'd know when to back off and let me do a run of material. And we got to a rhythm where I'd go over, you know, I'd do a run of material, I'd go to the piano to take a little drink of water or something, and he'd come back and here we go again. And all night long, the whole show, Best one of the best shows I've ever had. That's two hours, just kill That's it. That's unreal. I come off the stage, the manager comes up there, he says, You know who that was heckling you? I said, No, he said, It was Sean Penn. Oh, I go, Sean Penn? Gosh. He goes, Yeah, yeah, he wants to hang out with you. I said, Really? Yeah. So I go into the manager's office, they got all all the drinks. Mm-hmm. I'm drinking Diet Coke and smoking cigarettes. I'm I'm sober and Sean's doing what he's doing. And I'm there till like five in the morning or so. And I go, I can't hang anymore, you know. And, he wants to keep hanging. I said, I got to go. There's, there's a booth at the Waffle House for me and then a hotel bed, and that's it. He goes, oh, oh before you go, man, I got to say something to you. And I think he's going to go, you and me got to do a movie together or something, man. <laughs> you were hoping? Right? Yeah. yeah, that's what I'm thinking, right? He goes, you got to move to Los Angeles. I thought he knew who I was. I thought he knew. I thought he, he, he didn't know. He just thought he'd met a funny guy in South Carolina. Oh, and I thought to it, myself, yeah. when I went back to my room, I thought, I've been in Los Angeles for 10 years. I'm not making a dent. <laughs> the guy doesn't know who I am. Nobody uh, knows who I what am. What year is this? It's like 80, 90, 92, 92. Mm-hmm. So I go home, and I'm kind of depressed. And uh, I go, I got a daughter, right? And I go, I'm going to be on the road all the time. Look at the schedule. I'm going to be on the road all the time. I'm going to come back and see her once in a while. I'm going to miss her growing up. This is, and a friend of mine, Rick Rogers, says, look, man, you're a good writer. Why don't you write for sitcoms? How do you do that? He said, well, you, you write a spec script. I said, oh. He said, yeah, do that now. But, you know, you know some people who have sitcoms. Why don't you call them up and tell them you're writing a spec script? And then when they go to hire, because this was like February or whatever, right in the middle of the, the, the season. season yeah. He said, no, they can't. They're not hiring now. Right. But next fall, over the summer, before next fall, they'll consider you for staff. So I call up Tim Allen and Jerry Seinfeld and Roseanne. Those are the three people I knew who had sitcoms at the time. That night, Roseanne calls me back. I love you. You want a job? Show up at the studio tomorrow. Then I had written a spec script. Nothing. nothing. I just show up the next day and start writing for TV. Unreal. Is that? I, and it's who you meet in this business. Yeah. It's your friends. That's who give you the jobs. That's how you get the jobs. That's that's. It, you when you're coming up, all those people in your your circle of comedians. Mm-hmm. Were, I'd work with Roseanne. We got along. I was nice to her. She's nice, you know, and she had good memories of me. Thought I was funny, and how she just fired you? a whole bunch of people. So I was. <laughs> my timing was right. <laughs> uh, that's what I. There was I still blood hear. on the floor when I got there. <laughs> Mopped it, it up and took over the office. I used. Uh, I used. Uh, John Goodman used to come in all oh, the time. Oh, he was great. And I asked him once because all you read about and heard about was Roseanne blowing up on the set and all this stuff and. I said to him, I asked him once, I said, what do you do when all this shit hits the fan on the set? He said, I go into my dressing room, I'm a hired hand, I tell the AD, call me when we're ready to shoot, I do not get involved, it's got nothing to do with me, I'm ready to go to work. He's a great guy. I remember times, though, also on the set when things would get tight and blown up, and he would drop in some funny character or do something funny, he relieved a lot of tension. Yeah. He's a good guy. How long did you write for that? Uh, two seasons, and then uh, Jeff Foxworthy uh, had a show that was brought back. I think it was, I forget which one it was. ABC canceled, and NBC picked it up, or vice versa. And he saw me walking on this, the same lot. It was the same lot that Roseanne was on, Gary Shandling's show was mm-hmm. on there, Seinfeld, uh, uh, CBS Radford. And he, he was driving to the car, and he said, hey, Rich, I hadn't seen him in a while. And he said, I got, my show got picked up again. What are you doing? So I'm writing to Roseanne. He said, how about you come over to my show next season? And he had a nice offer, and I took it. And it started a nice uh, working for him for a while. And, and he was a great guy. How did you meet him? I go, he was, he's one of these guys. I'm, I'm uh, at the comedy, uh, uh, they had a, a Southeast, Southeast Laugh Off. It was a contest at the, um, at, the, at the Punchline in Atlanta, like 19, I want to say 84, something like that. Mm. Their first like contest, the Southeast Laugh Off. I think they all kind of would then feed into a national thing. So they asked me if I would... Uh, judge this night of, of comedy, all these comics. And there were a lot of comics who eventually, they all stayed in the business. There was James Gregory, there was Paul Clay, the, um, uh, 
Grant Turner, I think. There were a lot of comics. There were really good comics on the show. And Jeff Foxworthy. Well, I didn't know any of them. Right. Didn't, they, 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 didn't know any of them. And uh, J. Anthony Brown was, was around. I'm not sure if he was in this contest or not. But um, I, I, I thought Jeff Foxworthy was the best. I thought he was the best. Mm -hmm. And so uh, he won. And after the show, I go over to him. He's at the bar. And he's with his, who would become his wife, still his wife, Greg. And they're standing there. I think they just met. And I just introduced myself. Oh, I know who you are, Rich Scheider. I go, uh, that was fantastic. How long have you been doing? He said, oh, that's my first time. <laughs> I love it. I, I love wanted it. to quit the business. Like, that's yeah. your first time? I'm done. And of course, he, 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 you know, he, was, he was just a natural. And yeah. he, he's a great guy. He's just a natural. Yeah, and then he, he led to all the rest of those guys, Larry the Cable Guy and he, Ron White. He, when and you talk Bill about Engel. the comedy history, right? Mm. He showed, it became like a balkanization in the 90s where people started realizing you didn't have to go for the everybody. You know, like back in the day, you had three networks, so you tried to appeal to everybody. He was the one, by going just after his demographic of, of Southerners, that's what right. it was, right? People used to tell him, drop the accent, you can't make it in show business with that accent. And he refused to do it, and he stayed true to his roots. He showed that you could just go for your demographics. So people started going, I'm going to become the, the gay comedian, or I'm going to, I'm going to just go mm -hmm. for the Filipino crowd. I'm just going right. to go for the Mexican-American crowd. And just be honest to, like Richard Pryor did back in the, in the 70s. I'm just going to try to appeal to black people and not worry about white people anymore. And he, Jeff Fox, he showed, I think, in a large, large way, showed that staying true to who you are and you get your own demographic and just worry about that, true and first and foremost. Well, being a, being a stand-up comic, uh I, w I admire that, what you're talking about, right. that because what I see is that when those people do that, and you'll know this better than me, this besides the fact that they're just um, appealing to their demographic, then people realize, well, this guy's just funny. That, yeah, that's it. That's yeah. right. That's what happened to Pryor, of course, because right. white people went over, even though he wasn't trying to speak to them, trying to appeal to them. They were drawn to because he's just a hilarious guy. I think you're right. Yeah, because I think funny is funny. Right. It's, you know, just because somebody is a Southerner, a black person, an Asian person, person whatever, if you're funny to anybody, look, right. we're all the same. And, and exactly the human behavior. Yeah. Like, say, like, I never, look, I'm listening to Richard Pryor's album. I didn't know any junkies. I didn't know any street junkies. Mm -hmm. Right. But I knew lots of guys who were glue heads back in my day, right. who were whacked out on drugs, who were the same as that guy. And of course, a lot of winos. I didn't know winos, winos, but I knew guys who were drunks, right? And yeah. so I laughed at those characters because I recognized you knew them a lot people of guys around that me. Were drunks. Right, right, <laughs> right. But I mean, you, the human behavior is the same, no matter what color it was, basically, even though the way he framed language and, and his, yeah. his, his approach to it was differently, but it, it was all recognizable. No, I, I, li I like that because that's, like I said, which, what has led to people crossing over, right. you know, their, their demographic line, because, like I said, funny is funny. Right. It's that simple. You, you wrote a book. Um, what is it? Uh, Kicking Through the Ashes? Yeah. That's a really what? basically about my experience coming into comedy, and most it all takes place. I, I had a cutoff of, of when I started writing for TV, and mm -hmm. Roseanne was it in 92. Uh, so it just covers the 80s, largely a lot of it experience. So I tried to cover every aspect of what you do as a stand-up comic on when the road. When did you write this? Uh, I think I was published 2016, so about three years ago. Okay. Sure. It came out about three years ago, yeah. So, and it's basically your... your Journey into stand-up, how I got into doing it, starting mm -hmm. it, and then everything I was doing during it, the road. The people I met, I have a chapter on Robin Williams or Jay Leno or... Or, or my friend Mike McDonald or Bill Hicks or Kennison. Mm -hmm. Certain people got chapter little, they were little chapters. I mean, I'm, I mean, two, three pages. I kept everything so you could just, it's a toilet book. Right. You know, you, <laughs> you, you're one sitting, you finished a chapter, you feel like you accomplished something. Yeah. The, you, uh, you also did a documentary about uh, I Am uh, Comic. Jordan Brady uh, directed this doc, I Am Comic. Jordan Brady uh, came up to me after the, a book that Mark Schiff and I uh, uh, put out called I Killed, which were road stories. Uh -huh. Right. One day over uh, at, we were doing blue collar TV, and one day in the writers' room, there were a bunch of writers and producers, and Bill Engvall and Jeff Foxworthy and Ron White and Larry the Cable Guy and myself and Blaine Capatch. I think mm -hmm. there was another young comedian yep. besides Blaine. We all started doing road stories, and at the end of it, uh, uh, 
uh, this woman, I can't remember her last name, Emily, I think it was, she came over to me, she said, you got to write a book of those stories. Because we, we people, we were laughing so much, people were coming down the hallway from other offices, not even our show, to listen to these stories. I mean, we spent like two hours in there just telling stories. So out of that, Mark Schiff and I put this book together of road stories. And then uh, Jordan Brady came up to me. Uh, he said, I read that book. And wrote, I want to do a documentary about stand-up comedy. And that's how it happened. So you traveled all over the country doing no, that? No, we, 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 it was a low budget, so we just went to a few places, went to New York City, and, mm -hmm. and it was great because we interviewed some people who, like Greg Giraldo and all, and got, got to interview some people, uh, uh, Louis C.K. Yeah. We got to interview people there. And then, of course, Los Angeles, uh, we, we interviewed uh, Schimmel and Slayton, and everybody we get to, you know, uh, Tommy Davidson, everybody who, we, who would do it. Yeah. Carlos Mencia, a famous interview out of that thing. Because Carlos at the time was noted for stealing. That was a big controversy, <laughs> him and Joe Rogan. At that time? At that time, yeah. well at the time. I mean, just it was, it was a big controversy. Right. And um, his manager said, okay, you can interview Carlos, but you have to swear, uh, the agreement is you do not ask him about theft, thievery. Do not ask him. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you, I sat down, nice to meet you Carlos, he goes, he goes right into it. He goes, people want to know about me stealing? And he goes right into it. And his manager, his manager calls and gives us that. You, I told you. I said, hey, it's on tape. No, yeah, we I, said hello. He said, I'm a thief. That's how it worked. I mean, right. Yeah, he was, he was confronted by Rogan up at the store. Oh, a lot, a lot. So that was, all in, that was all sort of heated up at the time. But yeah, that was a fun documentary. Jordan did a great job. What, what made you start stand up? You know, I, I was always funny. And I was, I, I didn't realize I was depressed a lot. I, I, a, a girlfriend from college sent me all these letters I wrote to her, and I didn't even know if I knew the word then, but I was constantly saying, I'm depressed, I'm depressed, and these letters, I, and I, I just drawn the comedy, and once I started getting a couple laughs, once I started getting a couple laughs on stage, that's all I wanted to do. That's all, and I, I was, I don't know if I was gonna be a great lawyer or anything. I would have been a serviceable lawyer who died mm -hmm. in a drunk driving crash on the way to Atlantic City. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, was, um, I, was, um, I, was, I, I was attracted, and then the people I was hanging out with, I mean, by this place called L. Brookman's open in 1970, summer of 77. I'd been doing it about six months or seven months, whatever. It opened, and I started doing comedy there, and I met other people who were drawn to it. Kevin Rooney, who became my best friend. Ron Zimmerman, another great friend. Yes, I know uh, Ron uh, well. Uh, John Heyman, Bill Masters, Lewis Black was there, uh, David Cohen. People, there was all these comedians there, and I, all of a sudden I'm hanging out with people who, who we had the same shared interest in comedy, and I went, wow, these are the people, that, these are like the people I grew up with, who, but, but they really want to do it for life. <laughs> you know what I mean? Most people, they go, okay, I'm funny, funny, but I got to get serious now. Right. I, and and, I, and I, I was home. And then once I went to New York City, I didn't know New York City. I didn't know there was another comedy club or anything going on. Mm -hmm. And a friend of mine from law school came to El Brookman's one night and saw me. She goes, no, there are clubs filled with comics like you guys up in New York City. I was like, what? And she took me up there, and I, we couldn't get into the improv. We couldn't get into the comic strip. We, got in, we couldn't get into the Catch Rise Store. We get into the comic strip. And you know you're sitting in as a comic. I'm sitting in the audience watching comic after comic thinking, I'm funnier than this guy. I'm funnier than this guy. And then a guy goes up, Jerry Seinfeld, young Jerry Seinfeld. Jerry Seinfeld. Yeah. Do we know Jerry Seinfeld? And I'm yeah. telling you, That's the first time familiar. I saw him, I thought to myself, I got a lot of work to do. <laughs> he was bright, man. He was, he, he was sharp. His material was sharp. He had a whole bit about going to the amusement parks, a whole bit about amusement parks, and I'll never forget the helpless, or the bumper cars, the bumper cars, the helpless father and son team. That was yeah. one line to remember. I don't know why, but he was hilarious. You made, you made me think of something I read about you about... Um, your acting lessons, and <laughs> you you, uh, you studied a little while with Jeff Corey. And did you do it, did you? Yeah, oh I my studied God. with him too, and uh, <laughs> he was a tough, tough, oh, tough God. guy. It, it's like, he called you on everything. Yeah. But yeah. it was interesting to me that, I, tell the story about oh. the note. Yeah, so you we know? go in the first day, this is my memory, the first day of class, and other people told me they backed it up because they had the same experience with him. So first day of class, he says, there's a class full of people, we're all, he said, uh, all right, before we start, I want you to, to get, everybody had paper and pen, and write down what you would rather do if you aren't going to do acting. Write it down, whatever it is you want to do, whatever it is. So people write it down, and he, and he says, oh, what do you got? He comes around, so I want to do real estate, I'd like to sell real estate. Do it. Somebody else, I want to get into dentistry. Do it. Whatever, if you wrote anything besides acting, go do it now. Because you're going to get so much rejection. Yeah. It's my experience. The people 
who make it. The only way they make it is they have the mentality, this is the only thing I can do. I can't do anything else. And I wrote down stand-up comedy, right? That's all I wanted to do. So I didn't care about it. You know, it's just mm-hmm. like, he's like, well, uh, I don't know about this, but uh, that, that's a good attitude. That's, you know, that yeah, he, he knew about Yeah, it's the business. Right, yeah. that's the business. But I don't think, I don't remember if there was anybody who wrote, I can't do anything else. Yeah. I didn't think the whole class after that. They didn't quit, but, but I think they, yeah. they, they were like, oh, that, that seed of doubt was planted. Or- well, you don't realize it's kind of like a trick question <laughs> by him, you know? He, he was yeah. like, he was a sly guy, a great acting teacher, but he was like, you talk about if you weren't there in that scene, confrontational. I mean, I, I listened to him say to somebody, I can't remember, like, he, what the fuck are you doing? That's I, like, you're, you're supposed to be in character, you know? Yeah, yeah. You, you realize, I realized later, I didn't know anything about the guy, other than I knew he was in Butch Cassidy and Sundance oh, Kid, right? he worked a lot, yeah. But then I find out later that he was blackballed by the House Un-American yes. Activities Committee. He was one of those guys right. who was accused of being a communist or whatever. Mm-hmm. And he, a friend of mine, I forget who it is, has a story. They were doing a production on the beach, a commercial on the beach. And it was up by wherever it was, Malibu, where Jeff Corey lived. Mm-hmm. And he's walking on the beach, and he sees them, and he comes over, and he goes, one question, he goes, what are you doing here? We're doing a commercial. Is it union? Yeah, okay. <laughs> that, you know what I mean? He's one of those guys. Oh, yes. I mean, he was, it was like, he was that care oh, about yeah. any kind of crap. He'd been through the worst of whatever Hollywood could dole out. Right. And he was still there. That's right. And he was a big union guy. Yes. It was, I actually saw... Uh, after having studied with him a little while on a picket line at uh, when there was a commercial strike in I don't remember the 80s or what have you right but he was like he was you know one of these guys that yeah he was gonna call you it. on it I love I it I did it with also with uh, I studied one summer with Stella Adler out here <laughs> And but were we in class together? Yeah, maybe. I don't know. But <laughs> I, went, I bounced in every class. There yeah, was. well, so did I. It's like it's why I'm bouncing here right now. But it's <laughs> <laughs> it's we we're in class, and she was already up there. Yeah, she had a guy that stood with her all the time. You know, just to go like uh, Stella. We were talking about so and so because she would go. We're we're there must have been sixty people in the class. What have you? And everybody's listening to her talk. She pulls, she picks out this one guy and she goes over to him and she goes, honey, why are you here? And he goes, well, to, to learn about acting. And she goes, no, that's not why you're here. And he goes, yeah, that's why I'm here. Said, well. You look like you're lost in space. I don't think you should be here. I think you should go find something else to do. Yeah. And we're at, this came out of the blue, and it's it's a it's a microcosm of that old school of acting teaching, like Jeff and and her, where like if they don't feel you're there, you're dead oh, meat. Oh man, you've had it. And this poor guy, I felt so bad for him because it could have been me. Yeah, you know, you sit there. And again, her assistant had to come up to her and go like, uh, Stella, we, we were talking about um, acting or whatever. It's like, I, he's, a, he's, he's a trip. She's a trip. I had that happen. Uh, I was in Michael Chartleff. Yeah. Right, mm-hmm. right. So I was in his class, and I was in a scene, this guy named Jeffrey Lippa, who, you know, you meet people, you go, hey, I thought he was the best actor. Yeah. I mean, you know, doesn't great. Doesn't matter. Right, know. doesn't matter, you know. But I was doing a scene with him, and she says, what are you doing? I, you're just watching him act. I think, yeah, I am, kind of. <laughs> yeah, just kind of watching him act. I'm, I think it's pretty good. I, can I sit down over there? And I'll just read my lines out of the script that I don't know the lines. I've not been memorized. Oh, that's great. That's just unbelievable. I, I Look, you know, we, we all go through those kinds of experiences, I guess, with acting teachers, but it, it's such a trip when you sit back 15, 20, 30 years later and you go like, wow, you know, they said that to me or to him or like, your response, that's beautiful. It's like, I'm watching him act. It's yeah. like, you know, isn't he great? He's terrific, you know? man. <laughs> pay, pay attention. Yeah. Because this this guy's going to go somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he's, he's the real deal. But yeah. people don't realize that it's, uh, unfortunately, there are so many ah. talented people. Stand up, acting. It doesn't, necessarily have to do with talent no. it's you know a lot of it is is 
the right place at the right time, the same old story. I think, I, I always tend to go with talent will prevail. The cream rises, so to speak, but there's so many different factors in it mm -hmm. and people get discouraged for whatever reason. If I did a podcast, Eddie, I think my uh, Kevin Rooney and I were joking before I left, the podcast, my podcast be, why do you think you didn't make it? That would be my podcast. <laughs> That's a, yeah. The question why, why, why do you think you didn't get for... I, it, it's always like a gray area of what, what is making and what is not, right? Mm -hmm. If you've had a career where you've earned a living doing that, I think you've made it. Right. Whatever it is. I agree. Right? You've yeah. made it as that. Mm -hmm. and, but in comedy, stand-up comedy, I always think is that the, the benchmark for me was always to try to get to where you're a draw. Well, you're a draw. I don't care if it's, you can draw in the clubs or in a the theater, but if you're a draw, to me, that's made it. Yeah. I didn't make that. I didn't make that, so that was always kind of, that's still driving me probably in some fashion or another. Sure. But if you've made a living at doing it, whatever it is you're doing, you've been successful at that. Yeah, there's, well, know. that's like, you know, be, being a working actor or whatever. Right, right. And if you've made a living as an actor, you've made it. Right. You're successful. I get asked all the time, who, you know, like, who are your favorite comedians? And my answer is always the same. I have so many. Because there is, I don't have a one. And I, and I tell people, too, there are so many people that I could tell you their names that I like, but you won't have a clue as to who they are. Because sure. maybe they, they didn't make it in sure. terms of popularity. Sure. But they're as funny as anybody else. And for whatever reason, because they're... I don't know, their nose was in the wrong place or nobody uh, ever saw them. Who it, knows, yeah, who knows. There, there's My favorite no comedian is one that made me laugh last. The, the yeah, last one exactly. to make me laugh. I, uh, Sully McCullough the other night sure. at, at the Throckmorton made me laugh. Uh, he's my favorite comic. Yeah, so the next guy makes me laugh like that. <laughs> That's right. We okay. had Sully on. Sully's like... He's great. Yeah, he, he's a really good guy and, and funny. And you talk about yeah. stories. Yeah. I mean, he goes... He has stories like you just up the kazoo. You're... You know, I wish you so much luck with that. I really think with your history of stand-up comedy, because I, to me, that, that is so unique, as I said at the beginning, in the sense that we talk about the history, Mike and I talk about the history all the time, and we're talking about the 70s in and the, the 80s. 80s. I know, I know. And but I'm, that is ancient history yeah. now. But I like to get back to those guys who who changed the art form and what they meant at that time mm -hmm. to America, what they said about America at that time, that's what I'd like to get into. And, and, and getting laughs with their material. You know, find the jokes that will work today. That's right? interesting. That still work today. That's about, or the stories about them, the funny stories. Mm -hmm. So that's what I thrill about. I mean, it's a, I, you know, as, as somebody was saying the other, other night, I've got a lot of good feedback from the comics and the, and the, and the agents of, and the managers were there. Mm -hmm. Just keep making it funnier and funnier. Make it more and more yeah. entertaining. And that's what I'm trying to do. Well, it, because you also, you make it more you. You know, you're, yeah. you're, you're passionate about this project. And it, it's something that... It's all I care about doing. Yeah. It's so it's why I say, like, you know, spread it out. Make it longer. Do, do you, hopefully somebody will see it and go, like... We got to make this a uh, Netflix series or, or what have you. Be you could easily or do the that. History Channel. There we go. That wouldn't that be interesting? Anybody? Yeah. <laughs> well, Anybody? We'll get, Somebody. Let's, let's have a little advertisement here for the history of stand-up comedy by Rich Scheidner, guys. You really need to see this when he comes to your town. <laughs> or like, is this a book too? You have a well, book? I don't know. I started off as a book. Phyllis Diller was encouraging me to write a book. So 2008, I started researching it, and and uh, that's what it started off as. And I was dry. I was like, I have eight chapters, basically first draft of eight chapters of the history of it. And I'm like, this is reading like a textbook. And yeah, my just, wife, Rana, said, you got to get it up on its feet. Make it funny. Just go do it. Go perform it and make it funny. Maybe you'll find the jokes for the book. And once I started doing it on stage, of course, then... Uh, it's like, I like hearing those laughs, and so uh, that was it. Yeah. Well, Rich, thank you so much Thanks, for doing this. Thanks, Eddie. I really a appreciate Always it. Always thank this you, Eddie. Been, Love you, man. Is, thank you. This has been so much fun. Uh, I mean, and like I said earlier, too, about learning about your, your one-man show and the real history yeah. of stand-up and yeah. how, it, how it happened. Good luck with it. Thank you. Guys, thank you. Thanks, Mike Carano. Thanks, Rich Scheidner. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Come back, Rich. I, I, I got something for you. I just totally forgot. I want to give I you one a of my T-shirts. I yeah, get a T-shirt. You get a T-shirt, buddy. I got a T-shirt. What, what size do you wear? Extra large. All right, I've got that, boy. 
I got another improv T-shirt. Yes, sir. Well, there's a time when that's all I wore were the T-shirts. I have pictures of me with like a Catch Him Rising Star T-shirt or a, oh, man, you I know, comic you strip improv T-shirt. We're like, uh, let's see. Oh, thanks, Eddie. That. Beautiful. Are you kidding? Oh, I love this. that. This Thank is, you, man. Uh, another advertisement for. Oh no, no, no! Eddie's I love it. Bar man. at the Improv. Let's uh, podcast. Oh, it's great. It's Just great. Excel- definitely. Thanks, Eddie. It's yours. Thank you, brother. Thank you. I I so appreciate this. My pleasure.